Good morning. My name is Mary Ciccarelli. I'm a MedPeds physician at Indiana University School of Medicine, and I work at the Center for Youth and Adults with Conditions of Childhood. And today I've come to talk to you about a topic that sometimes causes a little bit of concern and anxiety in families and caregivers as they begin to think about the changes in young adults as they move into puberty and consider what um, growing towards an adult sexuality would look like. And we're going to talk today particularly about persons with Down syndrome. What you have in front of you now is a classical team timeline of all of the different moving parts that are happening developmentally in a young person as they move from childhood towards adulthood. And those changes happen across the practical domains like caring for one's own body and home and social domains being out in community and making friendships and financial demands being uh, um, completely dependent as a child moving into somebody who has a source of income and has more independence in managing that. Um, this can happen in someone in uh, in a residence where you reside with family or other persons or on your own um, as you move from primary to secondary education and out into higher education or the workforce um, uh, as well as out into community. Families, um, when they stop and think about what their goals are, helps it, it can help them think about how are they going to approach puberty and sexuality. Um, if you th plan with the future in mind, it helps you focus um, what your goals are now. So for example, if your goals for your child are for your child to be a, as become as independent as possible in personal care and social life, then you're going to recognize that they need to practice and try on new skills as they're growing. And if you want them to have a positive personal identity and feel good about themselves, they have to build up confidence and do things for themselves and be valued for the things that they do do for themselves and for others. If you want them to develop a network of personal relationships, then you have to think about how do we present opportunities to make friends and explore different leisure interests. And if you want to prepare for work in the out in community and adult life, you have to grow in multiple dimensions in, in how you think and plan, how you speak, and what academic skills you may be working on. Down syndrome. Uh, organizations have um, done some interesting work in trying to help families think about their expectations and what the expectations for the teens themselves might be. Um, I like this slide as it represents, of course, that teenagers with Down syndrome are people first and they want to have valuable, satisfying lives. And they seek, for the most part, inclusion um, with activities with same age peers. In teenage years, activities with parents are still interesting, but activities specifically with same age peers or, or a peer group of some sort um, starts to take on new meaning. Um, and to do that, that means you need some social skills and behavior that is a, a age appropriate to be able to function in that environment. Many parents and teachers say that they are feel challenged and charged um, to help treat teenagers in an age-appropriate manner rather than thinking that their skills aren't age-appropriate. Um, this means respecting their age, encourage their confidence and independence and self-esteem, and facilitate their inclusion. Teenagers are also challenged at times in participating in life in an age-appropriate manner, working on um, accommodations that they may need related to their speech and language abilities or their cognitive abilities. I like this slide because it just reminds us to think about what the rights of each individual are, regardless of what your diagnosis is or how you present yourself to the world. You want to express yourself. You need to express yourself. You want and need to participate in the world, receiving dignity and respect from those around you. You want to make choices. Practicing when saying yes and saying no is your choice and or the right thing to do in that circumstance. And this last one is the hardest. It's the right to have some risk. Some people use the term the dignity of risk when they talk about this and having the opportunity to try things out that might not be a sure thing yet, but require some attempts and maybe even some falls with little skin knees to get back up and try again. So what I want to talk about in the next 15 to 20 minutes is how we can explore issues that are related to the physical changes that happen in one's body um, um, in puberty 
um, and how those are specific to individuals with Down syndrome. And then think a little bit about the development of healthy and safe relationships in this same population. When patient, parents of children with intellectual disability stop and think about sexuality, they think about it as a scary or unknown topic. And if we make it less scary, we'll say everyone has sexuality from the time they're born. They are sensual and have feelings about their bodies and touch of other people. And all of that is part of our need for human touch. And as we start to think about it, as it relates to puberty and sexual development into adult sexual characteristics, um, parents ask questions like, will my child develop at the same rate as his peers? And what will it be like to teach a girl who has some cognitive limitations about menstruation and getting a monthly period? And what kind of touch of private parts is acceptable in what settings? We deal with this in, in infants and toddlers who have a propensity to touch their private parts when their diaper's off. But then how do we do this in a more socially acceptable way as people age and their bodies change and their bodies represent a more adult appearing body? How do you think about what dating is and what are the rules of dating in your family and in our society and for persons who have um, cognitive differences? And as we think about those things, what does safety mean within all of this context? How do I help my child be safe while still having some dignity of uh, risk and freedom and, in, and a level of independence that they're capable of managing? And what is child rearing and what, how do we think about child rearing and how do we think about sexual expression and birth control? I think it's important to um, stop and recognize that the world still has stereotypes for people with Down syndrome and intellectual disabilities. I'm sure I'm not telling you something you didn't know already, but thinking about them for a moment helps us think about sexuality um, and how we might have to think about these together as we're building sexual skills, puberty skills. These negative stereotypes for people with intellectual disability might say things like uh, people with ID um, are childlike as adults and they might be different, but they're still not children is the right response. Um, they might not have sexual feelings. Well, we know that fact is actually not true. They have sexual feelings. They don't understand desires or their sexual drive might not be controllable. We know that just like you can learn rules in different facets of your life, all facets of your life, you can learn rules about sexual expression and uh, community participation. And this one is a favorite stereotype of mine that people fear that having sexual education will make you want to do the things you were taught about. And there's such good evidence that that's not true. If we hide behaviors um, from individuals, um, it, it is more likely that they will find out about it in negative ways and be more unsafe by the lack of that education. So maybe we can think about adopting as a group a philosophy that recognizes the importance for children and young adults to have accurate age appropriate sexuality education and relationship as education as they grow and to encourage open and honest communication about these issues with the people in, in their lives with whom this is appropriate. That means parents and caregivers and professionals and not necessarily the kid in the last row on the school bus. And then how do we set positive messages about our sexuality as families, as community? I love this table and maybe this is one where you might pause the webinar and read each of these questions about what are our family's beliefs? Because every family has a culture around private and personal things like sexuality. And there isn't a right or a wrong answer to most of these questions. There are comfort levels and language levels and family rules that help us govern that. But if you stop and read each of these questions, it might be interesting to think about how do we want to present this information within our family to all the people who live within that family. One of my favorite authors on the topic of sexuality and young adults with Down syndrome is Terry Cohenhoven. And um, I'm gonna show you a couple of books that she's written that I think are very valuable to people who like books to help them 
um, work on this topic and uh, um, the book Teaching Children with Down Syndrome About Their Bodies, Boundaries and Sexuality is particularly good and goes through this whole list of topics that I have in front of you. Hygiene and socially appropriate encounters and what is public versus private and how does one express one's feelings and act with the different people in one's life. Um, what do you need to know specifically about how the body functions in a sexual manner? The next thing I want to talk about for a moment is um, how to think about learning when one has a learning difference. Most people with intellectual disabilities have some difficulties with abstraction and perceptual reasoning. And that those are big words, but what does it mean? It means trouble understanding information that might be abstract. So just a phrase that isn't clear, um, isn't language that they commonly know, how, figuring out how to put that into context in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, I like this expression maybe says it's better, but it's trouble visualizing. So as we talk, we often create pictures in our minds and going from language to the pictures in your mind is more difficult if you have trouble with abstraction or perceptual reasoning. Trouble manipulating thoughts and reasoning, making generalizations from rules, being able to make logical conclusions from rules you hold, all may be more difficult in persons with learning differences. And then trouble with verbal comprehension. Many people who have intellectual disability listen and can repeat back what they've heard, even at times when they don't know what the real meaning of that sentence is. So when someone echoes a sentence back, that isn't proof of understanding, that's just proof of hearing the words. And sometimes we have to separate those things out to recognize if the person really has understanding. It's never good to generalize um, uh, across the board, but um, it is interesting to look at the um, common socialization skills in persons with Down syndrome as well as their learning differences. There is a subcomponent of people with Down syndrome who also have differences in their social learning skills because they have additively autism with their Down syndrome. So I'm talking more about the person without autism perhaps when I talk about this prototypic person um, who has lots of enjoyment in social learning. And that person um, learns by watching social interactions. A person who has limits in their social skills won't learn just from social interactions. Many people with Down syndrome have better receiving language than expressing language so they understand what's being said to them but might not do as good a job in, as using words back to express that and might use gestures more to communicate than um, sentences. Visual and spatial processing is a way to learn from visual information so using graphics and pictures and photographs might help in learning in a way different than just using lots of words. Um, uh, on the other hand, if one has motor developmental delays, that might hold back your progress in being able to handle equipment and joining in physical activities to learn skills, or might mean it takes longer to practice motor skills if you're trying to acquire them. If your language intelligibility is a problem or hearing is a problem in figuring out how to work around those issues, um, we call working memory your ability to take something in right in this moment and use it. And so if you're not good at doing that and you need it, the words to be said and some visuals together, that means learning should happen in that different way. And if you are very sensitive to social cues around you, you might pick up on anxiety and disapproval and try to avoid situations that make that happen. And so being conscious of each individual's strengths and weaknesses is so important when we're trying to learn. So I love these five rules of how to think about education around everything with Down syndrome and learning differences, um, but in particular uh, with our topic today, and that is things need repetition. Saying it once doesn't mean the person knows it. Using examples that are clear and concrete in small bites, starting with basics and building over time and practicing with real world moments. The content one could include, it goes across the range of body parts and their functions, the rules of private and public, personal space, the rules of touch, 
and relationships and what rights I have and responsibilities when I'm in a social setting and how to avoid victimization. What is body image? Body image is the way you see yourself. And as your body changes, sometimes that can be confusing. If you don't understand that you're going to grow hair or parts of your body are going to change shape and appearance or you're going to start to have a period, um, those things can be very um, disconcerting, uncomfortable, and uh, worrisome. Uh, we see a lot in the world around us in terms of media messages and helping to have education around how things are projected and what that means and whether that projection that we see in social media is good. When people talk about their bodies being perfect, um, that sets a message that anybody has a need to be perfect or the possibility of being perfect. Having self-image means that you um, know who you are and what you're good at and what you're not good at and what you need help with. And all of this um, can be learned with positive language and good role modeling. We can go through the whole list of body part changes, but I think this slide just is a good list to help remind us of, the, of all of the different parts of the body that change during puberty. In Down syndrome in particular, um, the peak age of growth in males tends to be around age 12 and in girls close to age 11. And that growth spurt tends to start a little earlier um, than in um, uh, age, appro age appropriate peers. Um, uh, and the speed of growth the amount of growth tends to be less, so adult height tends to be shorter in this population. And on average, onset of menstrual periods, or fancy word menarche, is usually around age 12 and a half, but can be as young as 10 and a half and old as 14 and a half. A common way to think about this is that often after the earliest signs of um, breast development and hair growth, usually periods start approximately two years after that. And it is very common during the whole first year of menstruation to have relatively irregular periods. I'm going to show you a list of resources now in terms of thinking about what can I use to help with thinking about the language I use or the examples I set. There's lots of books um, and websites that you can use to help with this. I particularly, again, like the two Terry Cohenhoven books, The Boy's Guide to Growing Up and The Girl's Guide to Growing Up, but there's others um, that are great, What's Going On Down There for Boys, The Care and Keeping of You for Girls. Um, the Indiana Resource Center for Autism also has a number of great um, uh, tools, um, particularly about self-touch and masturbation and menstruation um, to help families. This toolkit from the Vanderbilt Kennedy Center is fabulous. It has both a book with lots of graphics and then a whole secondary workbook, and you can download these from free for free from this website. I also like the Canadian Down Syndrome um, a website because they have a number of tools that I think are great for teens and young adults. Um, the first one, Mind and Body Answer to Your Questions, is at that link, uh, and um, Down Syndrome and You and how you um, function as an adult are another great workbook that I really recommend downloading. So now that we've stopped and thought about what our house rules are and stopped and thought about how to um, educate people who have learning differences, let's talk about additional things to um, think about. How do you learn what your house rules are? How do you think about when you're little, you begin to teach kids at a certain age that they can't run around the house without their clothes on. And as they get older, they get toilet trained and then they acquire some of the rules of privacy and toileting and privacy and bathing. And when you have learning differences, those rules might progress slightly different for the person with a learning difference rather than the person who's typically developing. Um, but there are still rules related to that. There are rules about when you're allowed in your parents' room when they're not dressed. Um, stopping to think about all of those and how to teach those in a way that repeats, does it simply and in concrete manners and small steps are all important parts of puberty training. Um, sorry, I skipped a slide. This slide just is a good example um, from a Canadian website about um, how to think about what parts of your body are private. I use the rule that if it's covered by a bathing suit, we call that a private part. And so I would say women have three private parts, their breasts, their pubic area, their bottom, and men's, ha men have private two private parts, their pubic area and their um, uh, bottoms.
And then places can be private as well. So um, I um, like these graphics to show them, but I also like the, the concept of having a short shut door place versus an open door place and defining that this is shut door behavior, this is a shut door place. And the men's bathroom at school or the boys' bathroom at school that has multiple boys using urinals at the same time it isn't private in the same way your bathroom is at home. The bed at the furniture store isn't private in the same way your bed at your home is with the door closed. So thinking about how to define that in concrete ways that don't send the wrong messages like any bathroom, any bed is private. You might think about examples. Why is having a bath private? Well, because our private parts are showing um, and we have to touch those parts to wash them. And why is kissing in a manner that we would call sexy kissing, which is different than friendly kissing? Why is that private? And how could we explain that simply to someone? What are some of the social skills now that we're moving past what the body rules are into the social role rules? Well, listening and talking and sharing and having and experiencing emotions and recognizing them in someone else and and interacting with others and not always getting it right and knowing how to fix it are all part of social skills. And lots of things influence how we develop socially, not just our learning abilities, but our ability to talk the environment we're in and what expectations are set for us and how those expectations get managed in a consistent and clear manner. The Florida Developmental Disabilities um, Council has a great book called uh, uh, Sexuality Across the Lifespan. Um, this worksheet is a good example of practicing what emotions look like and seeing them in movies and in other places and explaining them and even practicing them by looking in the mirror and showing how you show that emotion. Um, I had an a, a opportunity to work with folks from um, the village of Marici here in Indianapolis and they've helped me think about how to break out different kinds of rules around the people who are in your life and how do you look at strangers differently than people that are associates who you know not very well or people who are brand new friends who you don't, also don't know very well and what are the rules with those persons and how do we establish them in the family? Do we share our phone with a stranger at a coffee shop? Do we loan them a dollar? Um, or is that reserved for the people who are trusted friends in our lives? Um, how do we address the differences between different kinds of community helpers at a grocery store, um, personal helpers at the doctor's office, um, and what are the rules for someone who we're going to date or become a partner, a girlfriend or a boyfriend with, and when do they fit in the same as new friends versus other friends versus trusted friends? Walking through that and actually defining that. I think it's a really cool task to take this list and help an individual say, right now, this person in your life fits in the category of new friend and therefore our behaviors with that person will look like these rules which is different than this other person who's been a trusted friend for a very long time who we have different rules for. The rules of dating can be found in a number of these resources I just showed you but um, here is a kind of a basic concept for how to think about them. The house rules in each house might be slightly different um, for different members of the family based on their social and cognitive development, but being explicit with what they are and helping individuals who have learning differences hear that there are rules for others as well is very important. And dating might take very small steps. Um, first, one of my favorite stories about an individual um, that uh, I um, got to work with is that um, uh, he was very interested in dating, but he was very afraid to talk to a girl. And and dating can't happen if you can't talk to a girl. And so you have to work on that first step way before you get to the point of asking a girl to be your partner. Um, and so it's taking those steps in the very small ways. And rather than saying, no, you'll never be able to dance with someone, say, well, if you have the goal that you want to dance at the prom, how are we going to take the first 10 steps that have to lead up to that? And let's practice with that step one, which is just meeting someone and introducing yourself um, and then having a conversation with them. And that might take some time to practice those introductory skills on the path to dating. 
I think that it is really important to prepare for discussions about intimate feelings and rules. We have feelings um, when we see someone and we think they're interesting and we might want to flirt with them. And what are the rules of flirting and how long can you stare at somebody you want to flirt with? I heard one family use a um, sec so many second rules. So maybe it's a three second rule that you can stare at somebody or a five second rule and staring longer than that is too long to stare in a social setting um, and practicing just what the rules of looking are um, uh, across a room is a very interesting skill as a basic skill in early dating. Thinking about what are emergencies in social settings. So how do you get out of a situation that you're in that you don't want to be in anymore? Becomes an interesting question, doesn't it? And thinking about how to um, uh, practice if someone asks you to do something that you don't want to do and you want to say no to. Um, as you're working on all of these skills with individuals, thinking about who else are caregivers or trusted personal helpers of a person and how, what do they need to know about these rules and steps you're working on so in different environments like community, school, and home, the rules can have consistency. So let's talk now about keeping safe and creating a balance between having some choice and being able to um, make some choices on one's own while still getting help from others to keep safe. I like the website I'm Determined. It's um, done by the Virginia Department of Education and it has lots of cool toolkits for families. Um, the National Center on Secondary Education and Transition also does and talks about the different things and skill sets one needs to practice across a lifetime to develop your best level of decision making skills. We all have abilities to make decisions. Um, it just might be at different, le we just might cap out at different levels of complexity um, as we're early in decision-making practice and as we grow. I love the um, developmental disabilities um, uh, websites from the uh, state of California. They have a whole website called Think, Plan, and Do. And this is breaks down planning to do things like asking someone out on a date or going to a prom um, uh, into the three big steps. And they do it for across some multiple domains, buying something, having a new activity in life, um, picking a job. And I recommend these handouts. Here's some examples. This is the um, how to think about making myself healthy, how to plan what to do once we've thought about that, and then how to actually practice that so I get better at it. A big safety issue is touching um, uh, uh, each other in a way that, number one, if you're the person who's going to touch someone, you use good consent to do that. And if you're someone who's going to receive a touch, you control what those touches are. Um, and so I like the language from an early childhood of what does good touch feel like? What does bad touch feel like? Good touch are touches that make us feel good, loved, cared about. Um, hurtful touches might leave a bruise or a mark or just make us feel uncomfortable and um, uh, sad. Um, we don't touch private parts of anybody else without permission and a good reason. Um, so thinking about how do we make hugging safe, side hugs compared to front hugs um, that hold maybe for too long and maybe we come back to a one second rule for a friendly kiss um, versus sexy kissing might last much longer than, a, than one second. Um, how do you ask a person for permission? Um, how do you learn about what the rules of keeping a secret are and when keeping a secret is acceptable and when it's not. And that's very confusing and needs concrete examples to help. If we've bought a present for someone, we're not going to tell them about it for a day. That might be a okay surprise, but um, so someone touching you in a way that made you um, feel either uncomfortable or, or just was a violation of a family rule might be specifically something we don't want to keep secrets about. This is examples from the uh, Florida uh, workbook again about what kinds of touch are appropriate in a person's rules. Is close hugging for a longer period of time with certain people in your life acceptable, whereas handshakes or fist bumps are better for other people in your life? I 
Um, even though the YouTube um, video consent for kids is written for kids, I think it really works well for people of all ages. Um, and it talks about having control of when you get to say yes and when you get to say no. Pay particular attention to the part where a child is uncomfortable being kissed by a family member um, uh, and kind of urge to do it even though they're uncomfortable. I think it makes us gives us food for thought about how to help a person learn to control, control their own body space. Practicing what saying no will look like is a really good thing. Using basic scripts like you would from a play, um, having a few sentences written down and practice them and saying things like, if someone says something to me that's that makes me feel uncomfortable, I should say, I don't think I'm allowed to do that. I have a rule that I don't do that. No, I'm going to say no to that. Um, I think I would like to call someone to help me because this rule is confusing. Um, all of those are um, things to practice and then practice. How would you say no if someone says one of these seven sentences to us? What would the response actually be? Bullying is something we hear a lot of talk about, and as a word, it might not have the same definition in everybody's head. So again, concrete examples, um, if someone calls you a name and makes you feel bad, if someone touches you without your permission, if someone laughs at you, not with you, um, those are all different kinds of ways of making someone feel uncomfortable and, and be un inappropriate in a social setting. And people can inadvertently act in a way that is unkind and they have to be taught and learn how to not do that and practice it and they also might have people who act in a way to them that is unkind and learning again what my script might be if someone's disrespectful to me I'm sorry I expect respect from everyone and you're not acting respectfully so I'm going to walk away now I'm going to go talk to these other people who are kinder to me all of those might be practiced scripts around this there's also the whole concept of people being your friend but not really being your friend or being a fake friend and that's a really hard concept and needs to be talked about in a concrete way. If someone's only friends with you and nobody else is watching, that's a conditional friend. Or if someone's only a friend with you because they want your money or want you to give them something that you have that they want to use, that's not really a friend. That's a manipulative friend. Um, and uh, and all of those are lessons that we might want to practice. I realize that the terms manipulative, conditional, and exploitative are the large words. And so I consolidate those all down into fake friends, people who, are, who might say they're your friends but are not really your friends. So we've talked about um, ways to think about bullying and teach respectful behavior, but it's also important for everybody to be observant and talk. If a child isn't aware that people are teasing them, helping them see that and learn how to speak for themselves and not act in a victimizing way might be another teaching method that can be employed. We also want to teach kids if someone else is being bullied that they should go tell an adult. Um, and as an adult, when we see it, we should stop it. So in summary, we talked about goals we might have for children with Down syndrome and teens and young adults. We want them to become as independent as possible in their lives and develop a positive personal identity and develop a network of personal relationships and prepare for a future working and adult life. And part of that is to have an accurate and developmentally appropriate education around sexuality and relationships. If you forget everything you heard today, you can contact us at kayak at iupui.edu. Thanks.